Hey, uh, I would uh, like to acknowledge um, Bob Catter, who's here today from the House of Reps, and um, sorry, I've got it. Lama McTiernan, member for Perth. And Alana McTiernan from the House of Representatives also is here today. Um, would anybody like to ask any questions of uh, any of the presenters? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Bob. Thank you. Sorry, look, I, I'm sorry. I, did, I was in a caucus meeting and didn't hear all the presentations. But one of uh, my concerns is that quite clearly there are ticks in Western Australia um, that are creating Lyme-like diseases, and that is not being recognised. Like a friend of mine, both her brother and her son, after working on the um, on the wheat bins in Cumberland. Um, both got ticks um, and both had sequelae. I mean, obviously not as bad as being wheelchair bound, but pretty long term chronic fatigue type um, consequences. Um, so, I guess one of my, and I'm, I do apologise, I'm sure this is probably being covered, but whilst the case in Japan is completely understandable, what, what has been done to get it recognised that there are the ticks here do carry, perhaps not the same, but still dangerous, um, uh, dangerous that I'm really thrilled from and I've been treating and diagnosing Lyme disease for 20 years. And I'm part of the Tick Borne Diseases Unit at Sydney University, and I liaise with Peter Irwin. Now, Peter Irwin is at Murdoch University, and he's actually looking at ticks. We found one novel Borrelia on one tick on one echidna. Now, uh, my understanding is that I think if we start looking at more echidnas, more ticks, we'll actually find more Borrelia. And I suspect, looking at the patients that we see, that we'll have a novel species. We'll have our own Borrelia Queenslandii or something. We'll give it a name, because there's two other Borrelia that have been discovered in America in the last 12 months. I think we'll have our own type. But because we've imported animals and we've got migratory birds coming down from Siberia and whatever, there's going to be all the Lyme disease bacteria here, that, but our ticks aren't as envenomated, aren't infected with these bugs as much as ticks, say, in the Black Forest or in America, which is why we don't... If we get a collection of ticks from Germany, 80% of the ticks will have Lyme disease in them, OK? That's what Peter Owen did. He got a whole lot of ticks sent over, studied them from Germany, and 80% had Borrelia. But he found one tick out of a, with one Borrelia in 196 ticks. But we actually need to look at thousands of ticks, tens of thousands from all over Australia. And when you're trying to find a bacteria in a tick, maybe you're trying to find something that's microscopic and it's mixed with a whole lot of other bugs that are good for you, you know, that might make you sick, but there's other bugs in there that might make you sick. And then there's viruses and there's parasites. So the actual technical component of trying to find something in a tick that is Lyme disease is actually quite difficult. But it's actually being done, and I think Peter Irwin has the capacity to do that. He's a vet, he's dogged, and he, he's on the case. Um, but if anyone's interested, I actually have a slide or a video of one of my patients who got a tick bite on the central coast of New South Wales, and I've got a slide of a video of their blood. And I'll show you the Borrelia in the blood, and this patient's never been overseas until she went to Germany to get treated. So I've been seeing these bugs in blood and whatever for years. We find, we do biopsies of people's rash. If they get a rash, we find it there. We did that with an infectious disease specialist in Sydney. But he's been sidelined because he doesn't have the common view. So that's the only research I know into ticks. And Sydney Uni, we're looking at patients. So we have 180 patients. We've taken five blood samples from each of those patients. Most of them have some Lyme-like illness and we're developing appropriate in test to understand how we can best test our patients and certainly the one that we use now which is almost 100% negative. In most patients that we test at Sydney University, that test was useless, the ELISA test. So Western blood and PCR testing is the gold standard and, and test. And why does it, sorry, can you just explain yeah. me a little bit the difference between the two tests? Um, look, an ELISA test, if you get, so if you get Ross River fever, you get a mosquito bite. You'll do a blood test and within a few weeks you'll get an IgM response. That's an antibody response, an acute response. And as the body starts to get rid of the virus, you'll produce IgG antibodies, immunoglobulins, and that'll be a memory antigen antibody. And that'll actually, 
be stored in your blood. So you test someone's blood and, oh, they're IgM positive. And six weeks later, they're recovered from the Rossberg fever and they'll have IgG positive and the IgM's gone. So this is an acute, this is good for acute infections that your body mounts an immune response to. Lyme disease hides. It doesn't have the antigenic, the body doesn't have an antigenic ability to detect it very easily and it has immunosuppresses you as it gets into your body. So it's a very clever bug. So the way to diagnose it is actually do what we call an immunoblot or Western blot test. So we look for the proteins that are part of the organism and measure the reactive reactions to that organism. So it's a slightly different test. Not an antibody test, it's actually looking at a reaction to various bands or proteins on the organism. And a polymase chain reaction test is actually growing the DNA, looking at the DNA of that particular organism and comparing it with a known normal. So you've got you do plate this DNA out so you do a normal little plate, you see all these little bands, tell you that that's the structure of this thing that you found. You've got a known normal, you go, ah, oh, that's Lyme disease, that's brilliant. Now, that should be standard first line tests. There are two labs in Australia doing this. One is not NARTA approved, but that's a political situation with Australian biologics. And Stephen Graves, who's been one of my critics over many years, is now doing the immunoblot and the PCR test. And He's not quite aware yet, but he's diagnosing Lyme disease in lots of my patients with his immunoblot test. So, but, you know, this is only the beginning, because the standard is do an ELISA test. It's not positive. It doesn't become positive until you treat people for two to three years. Maybe. Wrong test. And that's the gold standard test to diagnose it. So you automatically, people are not diagnosed from the first instance. It's wrong. Bad medicine. And, and, and uh, there are other ways that uh, people can get the disease. Yes. You can get it from your mother. You can get it through sexual intercourse. You can also get it from uh, blood transfusion. Blood transfusion. So, so if you take the tip bite out of the equation, there are still yes. many avenues to, to people to, to, uh, to actually get the disease and be healed. It should be part of our differential diagnosis. When someone has something really unusual and doesn't quite fit that diagnosis, we need to put Lyme disease and do the appropriate test at that first time that you see someone with something different. Because, I mean, all these labels that we give people and give them a straight diagnosis, oh, that's made of your own disease, that's chronic fatigue syndrome, it's nonsense. You know, because often they're not that, but that's just, oh, because doctors like to think in boxes. You know, and then they can treat, they know, oh, well, the is then you can't do anything for that. Oh, chronic fatigue, see the psychiatrist. And, and in Europe, the testing for Lyme's disease, Lyme disease is different. They Absolutely, use, they do. Immunoblot and they do PCR. And they do that in America as well. You use Igenix, uh, Galaxy Labs, Infector Lab, Arnhem Labs. Um, to, you know, these people, we all communicate together. They do the appropriate testing. And now the DAX, which is the German registration of uh, pathologists over there, has recently come under NATA. So the German tests are NATA approved. So if anyone says that's not a NATA approved lab in Germany, it is. And the tests that they give us are positive, and the tests they do in Australia are negative, and they're wrong. Senator Lovell. Uh, Thanks. Um, maybe while you're on your feet. Yep. Um, and apologies that I missed some of the early presentations as well. You'll get a copy. Is there, is there any genetic underpinning for people who are more or less likely to, to, to have be hit with this stuff? Yep. So That's a big question. And yes. The bottom line is yes. Now, I've been treating chronic illness for 20 years. I've been a doctor for 40 years. And one of my main interests now is looking at genetic predisposition of these illnesses and I've actually found a number of set gene groups of people who are more prone to develop these illnesses and be more affected by these organisms because they probably have disturbed immunity. So people with MTHFR mutation in their genetics or something called a pyrrol disorder syndrome, people will carry the celiac gene. So those three genetic disorders, those people seem to be more genetically predisposed. Not always, but that's my observation. I mean, this is not hard science. I'm just, I've been observing patients. I've treated 600 Lyme patients. So it's my observation. So where my question was heading, given the symptom set coincides yes. with ME, CFS, sometimes, yes. whether, and there's some really interesting work being done at Griffith University on genetic underpinnings of yep. ME, CFS, whether there's any crossover or whether they appear to be separate. Symptoms. Well, look, I think there's probably a crossover. So look, the Griffith University, without making strong aspersions to my thoughts and their thoughts, I don't think they've actually even grasped what they're dealing with. Because I don't think they actually see that the majority of people with these illnesses actually have an underpin, they're underpinned by an infection. 
So they might have genetic weakness, they might have genetic issues, but actually they've got an infection. And it's the, if you don't see the infection within the, that that's causing all these symptoms, and the genetic thing might be what happens if you get worse and develop a certain, certain symptom pattern, but primarily the problem is you've got an infection first. And that could be anybody. And you could get it sexually, you could be born with it, you could get it possibly from a blood transfusion, looking at some of the data coming out of Europe and Germany and uh, America, which is in our Senate submission to the ACIDS group. We put in all this first class evidence based medicine studies and put there in our ACIDS submission to the Senate inquiry. So does that answer? But I'm familiar with Griffith University, but I'm, I'm not liaising with them. I haven't asked to be invited up there, but as yet, I haven't had an invitation to go and talk. whether you could you be prepared to state that they're separate underlying syndromes, or whether there's like the missing crossover in terms of No, look, chronic fatigue syndrome, I mean, is a big issue. Now, I've treated 3,500 people with chronic fatigue syndrome. Of that group, a few hundred had Lyme disease. The majority of people with chronic fatigue syndrome actually have an infection called mycoplasma. So mycoplasma is an atypical bacteria, commonly causes chest infection, and it progressively, like Lyme disease, goes throughout your body and damages you. But if you look at my website, and I've got a lecture on this, I've divided it into 10 categories, and there's a whole lot of other factors, mitochondrial disorders, gut problems, people with heart disease, people with sleep disorders. So chronic fatigue is just a general overview syndrome. And Lyme disease, I regard as part of that because it often presents as chronic fatigue syndrome, but you've got to make the thought process, oh, this person had a tick bite or they look like they could have Lyme disease, and you do the appropriate test, and that's what you find. And then the nice thing about Lyme disease and chronic fatigue syndrome, you'll get them better. 70 to 80% of my patients fully recover, but it's going to take you two to five years to get you better. Okay? It's a long term process, and you've got to treat not just Lyme disease, but this plethora of other bugs. Often people have four or five co-infections and then they're debilitated. So it's a pretty tough illness to try and treat. And you're chasing your tail all the time, get rid of one, and then another bug seems to activate and cause more symptoms. And the Germans have been talking about this for a long time. They write great papers on this because they've, they've got a massive epidemic over there. But if you go to France, they're the same as Australia. They don't even believe it exists. They don't have a system of prevention, nor do they have a warning about ticks carrying Lyme disease, nor do they have a treatment service for it. Okay, you get chronic Lyme disease in France, it's like Australia. In Germany, it's totally different. Sorry, a bit long-winded. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, two questions. Um, I'm from North Queensland, of course. Um, yeah. But uh, we had massive tick numbers, and we don't have them quite so much now. The switch from um, British breeds to Brahman cattle, of course, which reject ticks. Um, um, maybe that's the reason I'm not sure, but. Um, but I, I, I still I haven't heard of it up there. Is that because nobody knows what it is? Or? Uh, look, it's probably two reasons. But not all ticks carry Lyme disease. Not all ticks are capable probably of carrying Lyme disease. Maybe the cattle tick is different from some of the other ticks that we, the ticks on native species. But I think also there's probably less people up there. And you're probably right. You probably don't know if it's up there because no one's actually been diagnosed with it. And there might be lots of people at home in wheelchairs, in bed, you know, being told they've just got chronic fatigue syndrome or something else. And really what they've got is Lyme disease. But, you know, up in Queensland, I mean, the thing that you've got a lot of is, you know, get brucellosis and leptospirosis, Q fever, all those other illnesses. And some of those also can come from ticks. But Lyme disease is up in North Queensland, but I think it's just population centres, smaller numbers of people, and lack of doctors. I mean, the, the, the further north, the, the most north, the northerly doctor I know is in Nambour. That's pretty, that's a long way from North Queensland. Our acids group is only 23 doctors, but I have a referral device of probably 200 doctors who send me patients. They don't want to be named because they're worried about getting deregistered by APRA and making the diagnosis. And, making, and treating people with this disease, especially outside the current guidelines, which is no guidelines. You know, you know, this is madness. We've got a major disease here that's killing people and making them incredibly debilitated, and we don't have a logical thought process about how to diagnose and treat it. And it's endemic in Australia. It's everywhere. It probably is up there, Bob. Okay? But, you don't, but the doctors don't recognise it or aren't trained to pick it up. There is actually a cluster of patients around the Mackay area so, um, well, I would be surprised if we didn't, but I'm pleased to hear that in the sense that at least we know 
Yeah. Uh, because we definitely haven't. I'm, I'm sort of being left with the impression that we don't know that we've got. Let well, us send some people to have a chat to you in your yeah. local office. Well, there's a lot of people that are North Queensland. There's a million people. Oh, I think I'm sure there are. There may be a lot of people with this illness, but if the medical profession hasn't got the capacity or the encouragement or the leadership, they're not even thinking of it. They might have a whole lot of people with a whole lot of funny diseases at home with pain syndromes, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, all these other terrible illnesses that you can get from this disease that looks like something else, and they're misdiagnosed, undertreated, underdiagnosed, and some of them will die, never actually having a diagnosis, not the right diagnosis. That's the problem. That's why we need, that's why this meeting's here. I mean, we need a political, this is, we need a bit of political clout to actually get people to think. That, look, I said this earlier, you missed this. This is a bit like the beginning of the AIDS epidemic. Then I was at the present in the beginning of the AIDS epidemic. I saw that. I buried a lot of my patients. It was tough. Okay? I'm burying my patients with Lyme disease now. You know? I don't want to see that again. We have to make a line in the sand and have... This is a serious illness. It's affecting thousands of Australians. Well, I don't know how many people have got it, but it's serious. Sorry. But, this is... I mean, I've seen this now in a number of different areas where the medical profession wants to shut down debate on stuff. Now, I mean, I just find, you know, given that, you know, our, our, our medicine is supposedly based on, on science, why is we, the medical profession become so outrageously anti-scientific uh, and, you know, confined to a norm? Well, I mean, if there was a few doctors in here, I'm sure the pikes would be out of it. I'd be on the floor and I'd be burning. <laughs> Because when I get up and speak, I, look, I don't, I don't shy away from this. I know I'm right. That's the problem. I know I'm right. I've got evidence of it's right. I've got the science backing me, and they're not listening. They're not reading the papers. I, look, I speak at college, we, I speak at conferences in Australia on Lyme disease when it doesn't exist here. You've got 50 doctors, but it's always the same doctors. We invite other people; they don't come. I go to conferences in America. There's a thousand doctors. But there's 320 million people there and 300,000 Americans getting Lyme disease every year. If we correlate that back to Australia, I don't think it's as severe as America, the numbers, but I'm sure there are tens of thousands of Australians with this. And maybe they don't even know they've even got a problem. They don't even know that they're not even diagnosed. And I think, I don't know, and most doctors are terrified to do what I'm doing because the paper is going to come down on them, someone's going to report me for saying something that's not true, next minute I'm up against the board and I'll have my registration taken away. And I can tell you I won't let that happen because I'll fight tooth and nail with the science because the science is what's got to happen. That's why we need, and one of the things we haven't got, like I'm part of Sydney University Tick-Borne Diseases Unit, I'm just an advisor, but we've got no money. We get our money from the Carl Manis Foundation, and that's a charity to raise money. And we're trying to make, you know, make, make a line in the sand, make a proper diagnosis, find the diagnostic criteria for Australia. We haven't got a cent. You have to find a pharmaceutical company. Oh, well, we company we haven't, we've tried, every, we've we've tried every avenue. We've tried for every grant, and we always get knocked back. But the people who treat this, and no offence to the people up in Griffiths University, they got millions of dollars to study chronic fatigue syndrome. I could have told them what that was without spending millions of dollars. And then they follow they, you know, these pathways. So lots of money is being spent in areas where it doesn't need to be spent. And we need money to actually finish the tick-borne diseases unit at Sydney Uni study. And I mean, we probably need half a million or something to finish that study. Peter Irwin needs support in Murdoch University to find the ticks. But then we need some way, collective process, to actually train doctors in this. Stop saying it doesn't exist. I'll come out, I'll train as many people as you like. I'll tell them how to diagnose it, how to treat it, bring in all the evidence, supply everybody with all the... The intellectual capacity is out there. The knowledge is there. It's just not... The doctors are... I don't know what it is. Can you, If you meet a doctor and tells you, oh, it doesn't exist in Australia, ask him why. I, I don't get saying, a proper answer. I think that the, part of the reason is there's a stigma, and people don't want to be on the wrong side of the stigma. And that is what why... What stigma? <coughs> well, if you associate yourself with this disease, you, you might be in the bucket with all the people who've got psychological problems, because that's how we're looked at. And so my view is we need a political solution that can get above yes. the stigma and say, um, this disease is real, it needs attention, and it needs attention from the best doctors, dedicated doctors like Richard, who have gone to the trouble to understand it, and use the evidence that we have. We have evidence. We have people who can educate doctors. We just need the politicians to take a stand for us and say this stigma 
has to be addressed and we can do it scientifically. We and, and, and look, and I think that the, if you look at the whole trajectory of what is going on with even a whole lot of um, mental illness conditions, even uh, psychiatric conditions yes. like schizophrenia, people are seeing more and more correlation yes. with um, viruses and, and bacteria that, you know, we are yes. basically a refectory for a whole heap of organisms yes. and everything, you know, our mental health well, is actually dependent well, on the bacteria doctor. in our gut. <laughs> that's, exactly <what's> <laughs> that's exactly what happened. Look, yeah. I, I treat mental illness. I get people sent to me by a psychiatrist saying, this person got a tick bite and they've got psychosis. They've got schizophrenia. What do you think, Richard? I do a test and they've got Lyme disease. I put them on antibiotics and they don't have schizophrenia anymore. It's like the autistic, you missed the talk, but I talk about autistic spectrum disorder. We have a thousand children in our clinic with autism. I work with a paediatrician. My guess, if it's anything like America, it's 40% of those children have, will have Lyme disease or a co-infection causing their autism. Treatable, curable, but how do you get there? You've got to do expensive tests overseas. How do you work about giving a child antibiotics for 12, 18 months? You know, this, this stuff is not easy to treat, but that's what we have to do. And it is a competition between our immune system and these bugs. And I think the bugs are winning. I think there's more and more people getting infectious disorders, and there's a whole lot of things that lower your immune response and diets and all sorts of things. People talk about things, but I think we're just living longer. We've got more bugs exposed to us. We're travelling around the world. This is a world disease. The fastest growing vector-borne illness in the world. People travel all around the world, and we have our own variety here. So we have overseas blind-borne patients, and we have patients who come back here to have it, and we have people who get tick bites in, you know, down in Pitwater in Sydney who get it. You know, or any any area where there's ticks that could carry it, but not all ticks carry it. That's the problem. That's why we can't find it in the ticks. It's sort of a round the circle, but political leadership's what's needed. I mean, I wish Susan Lay was here, and you know, you know maybe Gary Lum or Chris Bagley. I talk to them. I talk to the doctors, and they're just saying we're waiting for the evidence. Well, the evidence is there. It just takes leadership. So, you know, they need to be talked to, and so you need to act on it. Can I make an observation? Uh, yes. For a year now, I've been studying on behalf of the centre research into research, questioning the whole ethos of global and Australia's research. And there is emerging a quality assurance crisis about the ability of Australia to deliver the knowledge economy research of a good standard that will be accepted globally. Now, we talk about, but in the rhetoric, punching above our weight. Here's a great example of punching well below our weight. No, so what we're looking at is all manner of concerns about research on worldwide. We're getting fabricated data, data by the bucket load. Uh, falsification of data. Uh, peer reviews that are falsified. Um, 179 professors in 110 South Korean universities criminally indicted in December for copyright fraud. So, you know, while we're, you know, not really paying attention to our own quality assurance concerns, this is the kind of uh, result that Richard's talking about. He's forecasting the future, which to me is as clear as day. But there's an attitude problem, a really deep uh, attitude problem. And you have to look beyond the acronyms of APRA and RCPA to say, who are the people in these organisations yeah. orchestrating 